Okay, then Ajahn. Good, so this is our second start. And I think we can go. So welcoming Ajahn from Mali again. Okay, so let us begin. So welcome back everyone. And, and uh, obviously again, continue where we left all yesterday. And, and the, uh, the sutta that is coming up next day is called With Mahanama. And uh, the idea behind this sutta is to explore some of the ideas for giving rise to joy in the Buddhist heart. But this is all about the, uh, using various and perceptions to be rise to happiness and joy. And uh, as we have seen so far, there have been two kind of uh, main ways of giving rise to that joy. One was based on faith. Yeah, you started with faith or confidence, so, and joy comes through that. And, and the other one is through virtue or morality, where you are just happy with yourself. You think, yeah, you know, I'm living a good life and doing the right thing and having a sense of inner contentment with your own life and how you, how you live. Um, we also, yesterday, we also had a look at how to overcome uh, resentment and ill will, and uh, which is very closely related to the idea of metta and compassion. And uh, that is another way of giving rise to that joy from the path here, yeah? having joy, uh, kind of adding some metta into the, into the breath or into whatever meditation or thing you're using. And then uh, kind of giving joy in that way. So that's another pathway into that. But, but now we want to look at these specific uh, ways that are taught by the Buddha in the suttas and how to give rise to joy. And uh, these are called anusattis in Pali. And anusatti is related to the word sati, which obviously means mindfulness or is translated as mindfulness. So, and anu is something like a long way there. So mind, a mindfulness along with the idea is basically recollection. You know, the idea of um, bringing to mind certain perceptions or certain ideas, recalling those ideas, if you like. Yeah, like yeah, specifically, these ideas here are the uh, qualities of the Buddha, and the qualities of the Dhamma, and qualities of the Sangha, and then you have recollection of your virtuous conduct, recollection of the generosity. And the last one, which is kind of unusual, is the recollection of the daemons, the divine beings. Uh, and these are the six ways to uh, give rise to joy. And uh, so let's see how this is done. And these are very standard uh, passages that you find in a number of places in the suttas. So, uh, this is from the uh, Anguttara Nikaya. This is the numerical discourses of the Buddha, the chapter, the sixth chapter. And, the tenth sutta, and so this is about the uh, groups of six qualities, if you like, so six recollections in this case. And this is how it goes. At one time, the Buddha was staying in the land of the Sakyans near Kapilavatu in the Banyan tree monastery. Then Mahanama the Sakyan went up to the Buddha, bowed, sat down to one side, and said to him, Sir, when a noble disciple has reached the fruit and understood the instruction, what kind of meditation do they practice? Do they frequently practice? Uh, so here we have the Buddha staying in the land of the Sankhya. So this is the land of his own tribe, his own family, if you like it. And Kapilavatu being the uh, capital, the main city in the Sankhya Republic. If you travel to the India today, you can still find these places that are still there and have been discovered. And uh, the location of these places is quite certain because the archaeological evidence fits with the historical evidence. They kind of cross, they, they, they cross check each other. So we know what these places are. And there was a famous monastery there called the Nigrod Arama. And Nigrod Arama is a fat empty monastery. But in tree is one of these large fig trees. And they are the kind of favorite. Haunt, if you like, of the monastics. They could love these large trees and they have really good shade and good uh, protection against the weather, against the, the, you know, especially the rain and that sort of thing. And so they will hang out at the roots of these trees. And, and very often, the roots of these uh, large big trees, they would be like enormous kind of roots coming down. You can sit inside the root, almost like a little house almost. But, 
If you're sitting there, you can really be shaded from the elements outside. So uh, the Buddha is here essentially visit, visiting his family and he is uh, visiting Mahanama the Sanke, who was supposed to be one of his cousins. Yeah? And all are very interested in this, uh, uh, the Buddhist path. Actually, there is a nice story about Mahanama the Sanke. Uh, there's a, uh, this comes to mind now because I'm talking about this. This is the story of um, uh, from the Vinaya Pitaka. This is the story of Mahanama and uh, his, uh, his his brother Anuruddha. There were two brothers, Mahanama and Anuruddha. They were both cousins of the Buddha. And after the Buddha had hanged on four, they are kind of thinking that yeah, every, every family should have one person, one young man. I think it was still young men at that time. I'm sure the young women has, has, or had already been allowed to go forward. But uh, and so at least one young person in the family should go forward. Yeah, the Buddha, our cousin, is the mind one. We need to find someone in this family as well. And this was what Mahanama was thinking. And so he goes to Anuruddha, his brother, and said, oh, you know, one of us should go forward. One of us should become a monk. Yeah. And Anuruddha said, ah, oh, too hard to be a monk. You know, I've been kind of brought up really softly. I've been getting everything my whole life. I'm really spoiled. I'm a spoiled brat. He didn't use those words, but that's kind of the implication. I'm really spoiled. I can't deal with all the hardship of monastic life. You go for it. And then Mahanama says to him, well, if I go for it, well, then you have to look after all the chores of the household life. And I realized, like, well, what, what are those chores of the household life? He doesn't even know what the chores of the household life are. It's, it's really a bit too spoiled that it's bringing up. But, and then Mahanama tells him, well, when the kind of the uh, season begins, you have to get out into the field and you have to plow the fields. And after plowing the fields, they had to sow the seeds. And after sowing the seeds, they had to weed the fields. And after weeding the fields, they had to let the water into the field. And after letting the water in, you had to drain the fields. And when the harvest is ripe, you have to uh, uh, reap the field. And when, they, when all the thing had been reaped, you have to thresh it to get the grain out of the straw. Also. And then you have to store all the grain in the grain silos. And then you have to get rid of the straw somehow. Yeah? And then after doing that, yeah, maybe for the, you're ready for the next season. You have to start all over again. And Anuruddha says, This is terrible. This does this, this go on forever. When can you ever rest? When can you ever relax? And Mahanama tells him, Well, while working in this way, our fathers and grandfathers have all passed away. And then Anuruddha says, Well, in that case, I will go for it. You remain in the household life. <laughs> That was Anuruddha for you. He was this, this really spoiled, uh, spoiled young man, and he didn't know how to, what to do with himself. So this is why Mahanama is here in town, yeah, staying behind in the house of life. But Anuruddha, he has already gone forward and become one of the great disciples of the Buddha. So even though he was a, a bit lazy and a bit spoiled, he turned out to be good monk material. Maybe being lazy is a good thing for monks. So. Is it? I wonder whether that's true. Is it good to be lazy in a certain way? Yeah, having the ability to just not do anything, yeah? having the ability just to relax, not feeling compelled to do stuff all the time or to talk all the time. I think that makes for both good monk and nun material, probably good laborist material as well, likely that you can just kind of you know chill with things. You know, you don't have all these compulsions inside of you always driving you along. Yeah. Anyway, so Mahanama was left behind, yeah? So then he comes to the Buddha and he asks this question. Yeah? And um, uh, he says, for someone who has reached the fruit and understood the instruction, uh, what kind of meditation do they practice? So reached the fruit, understood the instruction, means someone who is already a stream enter, someone who is already a noble person. So these are teachings, so these are um, Contemplations that are especially powerful if you are a noble person, because if you are a noble person, because you have direct access to these teachings personally through your experience, it becomes much more easy. You know what these contemplations mean. You know the meaning of the Buddha, the Dhamma. You know what it's pointing to. You know the essence of these things. So that, for that reason, they become particularly powerful when you are a noble person. 
But elsewhere, they also talked about two people who are not noble ones. So it's not just for the noble ones. It's just that the noble ones do this frequently. And for them, it is very easy to give rise to joy because you know what these things are. For people who are not noble ones, the majority of people, it takes a bit more effort, a bit more training to give rise to joy using these kind of contemplations. So it is really for everybody. It's just that the, the degree to which it's done will vary now. And the Buddha replies to him. He says, Mahatnama, when a noble disciple has reached a fruit and uh, understood the instructions, uh, they frequently practice this kind of meditation. Firstly, the noble disciple recollects the Buddha. That Buddha is perfected a fully awakened Buddha, accomplished in knowledge and conduct, holy, knower of the world, supreme guide for those who wish to train, teacher of gods and humans, awakened and blessed. So that is the basic contemplation. Yeah, that's what we're supposed to do. And based on that, uh, yeah, the following habits. Uh, when a noble disciple recollects the Buddha or the realized one, their mind is not full of desire, ill will, and confusion. At that time, their mind is straight, based on the realized one. And a noble disciple whose mind is straight finds joy in the meaning, in the teaching, and finds joy connected with the teaching. When the joyful rapture springs up, when the mind is full of rapture, the body becomes tranquil. When the body is tranquil, they feel bliss. And when they're blissful, their mind becomes stilled. Yeah, you recognize that sequence, same sequence we have seen all the way through here. This is called a noble disciple who lives in balance among people who are unbalanced, who lives untroubled among people who are troubled. They enter the stream of the teaching and develop the recollection of the Buddha. So this whole idea here is the idea of using that initial impetus, yeah, of re recalling these things in the uh, appropriate way, and then that whole sequence arising out of that. Uh, so it's a very, uh, very powerful thing. Once the joy gets started, once you kind of give rise to that, uh, then you, you can use almost any kind of meditation object, like the breath or whatever, to strengthen that, yeah, and to kind of make it really powerful. Um, I'm just going to bring up a sutta here to make sure I know what I'm talking about, uh, just so I have the Pali available. Man. So I'm a bit of Pali, Pali nerd. I like to have the Pali around so I can kind of see what's going on there. Okay, no, that's, that's really nice. Um, so, so here it start, the whole thing starts off by recalling the Buddha, yeah, and the, the realized one, as it says here. And uh, uh, this is really can be done in many different ways. There is no absolute right way or wrong way of recalling the Buddha. The idea is just to kind of get a feeling for who the Buddha really was as a person. What are the things that make him special? What are the things that kind of make him stand out from ordinary people? How can we relate to this teacher who lived two and a half thousand years, years ago in such a way that we actually make him our teacher right here and right now? This is what this really is about. And what is interesting is that the Buddha himself, he gives us a particular formula for recalling his qualities. Yeah, he tells us, if you're going to think about me, this is how you think about me. Yeah. And of course, that formula, for those of you who have been around for a while, you will know that formula straight away. It is the Itipi So formula. Itipi So Bhagava Arahang Samma Sambuddho Nidja Tarama Sampanno Sugato Lokamidu, right? That, that one there. Yeah. And then the same one later on for the Dhamma and the Sangha. So this is how the Buddha recommends how we should recall these qualities. So for that reason, it is useful to, you know, to um, try to understand what the Buddha is trying to say when he actually gives us these hints about what he really is about. 
So let's just have a fairly quick look at this because um, uh, all of these things can take a long time if you go into great detail, but uh, at least to have some idea what is going on here. Yeah? Uh, the Buddha, the blessed one, is perfected. Yeah? Perfected here has a very specific meaning. It's a perfected in the Buddhist, Buddhist sense. It is perfected in the sense of not having any defilements and also in the sense of having a full insight into the nature of reality. Yeah? This is a translation here of Arahant. Uh, an arahant usually means a worthy one, but you are worthy precisely because you are perfected, because you have you have kind of risen above the normal human condition and uh, uh, taken, in a sense, taken the human condition to its highest potential. This is what this really is about, the idea of being an arahant. Um, yeah. Uh, and then you have a fully awakened Buddha, yeah? Samma Sam Buddha. And uh, here, of course, one of the uh, critical words here is the idea of Buddha, the idea of awakening, sometimes translated as enlightenment or enlightened, which I think is also, it is also okay. Yeah, personally, I think I prefer awakened because uh, uh, to me it is a bit more meaningful. Uh, has this idea that we're all kind of walking around in slight darkness and delusion. We don't really know what's going on. And one day, it's like an eye, internal eye of wisdom uh, kind of comes, you know, arises. And from then on, we understand the world and reality in a new way. The idea of waking up to reality. We're all a little bit dazed. We're all a little bit kind of asleep. We all really have this kind of um, uh, distorted idea of, of, of the world and, and everything. Yeah? And suddenly one day you wake up to something. Yeah? There's something to me quite compelling about that. And it fits with the idea where the Buddha talks about the sensory world as a dream. Yeah, it doesn't really, you never really get hold of it. It's always slightly out of your grip. It's always somewhere in the future. Yeah? Whereas this is really in the present moment. You really see things according to reality. The Buddha has awakened to reality. He's become the eye of the world. Yeah, he sees first, and then he becomes a teacher, passing it on to other people afterwards. So then it says he is accomplished in knowledge and conduct. And <clears throat> accomplished in knowledge, the Pali word for knowledge here is a vija. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the vija typically in Buddhism refers to the te vija, the three kinds of knowledges. And, and those three kinds of knowledges are the, the knowledge of uh, remembering your past, like that, the knowledge of the workings of that process. In other words, kamma, how the past, the um, uh, rebirth process actually occurs. Uh, and the last of the three knowledges is the knowledge of enlightenment or awakening itself, yeah? Seeing the Four Noble Truths, that's basically what that knowledge is about, the last one. Yeah? That's already kind of fascinating, yeah? Real knowledge of Buddhism can be summarized in these three knowledges. And of course, rebirth is one of those fundamental knowledges. If you want to talk about insight, if you want to talk about vipassana, or abhinya, and all of these words for wisdom and insight, well, this is really it. Yeah? I know Ajahn Brahm, he always likes to, to kind of be a bit, uh, look at things in a slightly different way, and this talks about the three insights instead of the three knowledges. Yeah? And that is, uh, I think, very much to the point. Yeah? These are insights in the sense that they really change your outlook. Yeah? They make you look at the world in an entirely new way. Yeah? That is why the Buddha went through these particular insights on his night of awakening. There are lesser insights, yeah, we can get insight into anything really, but these are the big ones. Uh, these are the ones that really matter. Uh, and so calling these the three insights, I think, is very, very, very much to the point. Uh, but, and then when you have those insights, uh, then something happens to you. Uh, and what happens to you is that you end the defilements of the mind, that yeah, you see things clearly. And because you end the defilements of your mind, it means you become your conduct becomes perfected. You can no longer that many things you can no longer do. Yeah, you can no longer mess around in the world of sens sensory pleasures. You can no longer become angry and have ill will. You're always peaceful, you're always mindful, always aware of what's happening around you. Your sense restraint is perfected. Yeah, your, 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 your way of looking at the world is just completely different. And you can no longer 
do bad things. Yeah? And your conduct is also purified. Of course, that is very important because this means that there is an external way of validating whether someone is awakened or not, at least partially validating that. If someone's behavior is really gross, you know, straight away, there's no way that they can be awakened. You know, sometimes people talk about crazy wisdom, but no, you're either crazy or you're wise. You can't have both at the same time. You can't do all kind of crazy things like drink, get drunk, and 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 and, and what have you, like some of these uh, uh, scallywag teachers sometimes do. <laughs> you just can't do that. Yeah, either you are awakened and you are perfect in your conduct, or you are not, and that's kind of this is how where it goes. So the early Buddhist teachings and the Theravada Buddhism in particular it has a very kind of sober view of these things. Yeah, it is not a kind of teaching where you have to rely on uh, uh, other people saying, yeah, I'm enlightened, but you wouldn't be able to know. So just trust me and just do what I say, just bow down and you will be fine. It, it, no, Theravada Buddhism is not, not, not like that at all. It's the exact opposite. You are in charge of your own spiritual life, which is great. Don't just hand over your spiritual life into the hands of others. Uh, if you do that, it's dangerous. That's where abuse comes. That's where all these kind of spiritual cults and sects come from, precisely from that. Uh, so you take charge of your own spiritual life. Don't be afraid of judging who has the act together and who hasn't. And because if you don't do that, if you have other people to make that judgment for you, then it's a situation that is ripe for abuse right there. So be, be careful then. Be smart about this. Yeah? And uh, so this is one of those great little sentences in the pseudo that kind of allows you, you to be in charge. You look for the right conduct then you are on reasonably safe ground. So, of course, I would never say make any absolute judgments. The moment you make an absolute judgment, you have a problem. But uh, at least you can make a kind of preliminary judgment uh, yeah, based on what you see. Uh, so you kind of hold back a little bit uh, because you are a little bit concerned about what's going on. Uh. So knowledge implies conduct. Uh, yeah. And this is an um, important fact here. Uh, the Buddha is holy, holy. Sukato, yeah, he has gone to a good destination. He has, you, can, you could maybe pass even as happy, yeah, that's a possibility. Uh, even though it sounds a bit kind of, uh, I don't know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a bit of an understatement to say the Buddha is happy. Yeah. But uh, it's, you know, in, in the higher sense, it would be true. Yeah. Um, so one of the epithets of the Buddha, Sugato, literally means one who has gone well, yeah? in other words, arrived at some kind of higher reality. Yeah? He is a knower of the world, yeah? and um, knower of the world could, in theory, mean a large number of things. It could mean understanding the realms of existence and the karma and all of this kind of stuff. But, uh, Really, what it means to me means that he has an understanding of the limits of happiness and suffering in the world. Yeah? And uh, you, to be able to understand those limits, you have to know all there is to samsaric existence, the whole potential in samsaric existence. It is not enough to know about the human realm. You have to know about rebirth. You have to know the potential those rebirths have. Yeah, there's various kinds of realms you might get reborn in, but lower realms or higher realms. And then you have to understand how they all interact, how you can move from one to the next one, and how that is based on karma. Yeah. And um, and an important part of this idea of karma is that karma itself is a selfless process. So you're not really in charge, you're not really running that karma. Mound, as if, well, if it is karma, I can just make sure I make good karma, I will always have a good rebirth, but it doesn't work like that because we get trapped in the ways of doing things whereby we actually make bad karma. Remember, non not really able to always do the right thing, otherwise, there wouldn't be an issue here at all. So, this is what we understand the whole kind of gamut of um, happiness in the world, and he weighs it up, yeah, and he looks at it and he says, well, actually. There's a big problem here. There's something here. I'm really, in the end, there's far more suffering than happiness. And even the happiness actually isn't really all it's cracked up to be. It isn't all that interesting. It turns out to be far more empty than you would think. 
And based on that weighing up and seeing the problems of samsara existence, well, that's when the Buddha makes, you know, finally says, well, okay, points to one thing here. We need to make an escape from this because this is inherently problematic. Not only is it problematic, but it's also meaningless. The idea of just going round and round, roaming around, not really having any direction, not actually going anywhere. After a while, you see how terrible that actually is and how pointless it is. This is the whole idea of getting the bird's eye view, is standing back. One life, things seem so purposeful. Yeah? If you're kind of you are starting out in this world, you're still young, maybe you're, you're at university or whatever, and, and you look at the life ahead of you, and it may seem very purposeful. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna get a good education, yeah, and make sure I know all of these things, and I'll get a good job, and I will kind of contribute to the world and make the world a better place, and then I will have a family and raise some nice kids who also contribute to the world. And yeah, this is really purposeful. But you see that this just goes on and on and on, life after life, exactly the same thing. And the world doesn't actually get anywhere. The world just goes back and forth in circles. And you yourself don't really go anywhere. You just do everything over and over. And all of these things, after a while, it seems pointless. It's actually much worse than pointless. It's like a Nightmare, like Groundhog Day, or whatever that movie. I've never seen this movie, but I've heard about it. It's a, like things is happening again and again without any real, without goal, without aim, without purpose. And uh, it, you would laugh about it if it wasn't so tragic in a way and so you know hopeless. And you need sometimes you need someone like a Buddha to tell you these things because we just haven't got that perspective. <laughs> And it sounds bleak, but of course, the point is that there is a solution to these things. So that is like the knower of the world. And then uh, the Buddha is said to be the supreme guide for those who wish to be trained. Yeah. So because he is the knower of the world, and because he has the uh, compassion for living beings, he understands the suffering of living beings, uh, and he knows that he has the solution to that suffering. That's why he becomes the supreme guide. That combination of compassion and wisdom, the two things that kind of drive the Buddha, the driving force is the compassion, and the wisdom is the knowledge that he knows how to resolve the problems that beings have. Yeah, so the compassion and wisdom, these are the two things you can almost define the Buddha by those two things. The only thing that drives the Buddha is compassion. He has no other motives yeah, for doing anything. Why? Because he has found the highest happiness. He is not interested in fame. In fact, he has the opposite idea. He doesn't like fame. He doesn't want to have disciples because he knows it's a hassle. It's going to detract from his happiness. He doesn't want anything in the world because he knows that it is a lower kind of happiness. So the only driving force in the world is compassion. He wants to help other beings. And of course, what that means is that the way he teaches is very pure. Yeah, he teaches without any kind of ulterior motives. Uh, he just teaches because he is kind and caring, and he wants to help other beings. Uh, there's something marvelous about that. And when you sort of get that feel, the feel that there are ulterior motives, motives here. Almost everyone in this world has a little bit of ulterior motive. Yeah, if you are a teacher in the school, well, you want to make a salary at least. You know, there, there's always something more to it than just kindness and compassion. But for the Buddha, there isn't. And when you get that, uh, then you start to listen to these teachings in a new way because they are only there out of compassion for every one of us. They're only there to help us find happiness in the world and all who comes up. There's no other reason for these teachings. Uh, and of course, then they become much more meaningful. Then you start really to listen. Yeah, you really attend because you know, whoa, there is something really interesting. They probably go on here. This is how the Buddha, how the Buddha is motivated. Uh, and you listen in a, in a different way. But it's not just that, that the Buddha came from compassion, but there's this other thing I mentioned the other day that uh, the Buddha, when he taught the Dhamma, he taught it for everyone, regardless of culture, regardless of age and time and all of these kind of things. Uh, he talked to the universal aspects of a human being, uh, to the human psychology as it is, as everyone has to face their own psychology regardless of uh, when you are born and all of these things. 
And uh, this is why we find in the street of the Dhamma, he says wrong thing, the he knows that this is going to carry on for a long time into the future, cross the various boundaries and things in the world and reach out to, to all of humanity, even beyond humanity, to the Devaloka, to anyone basically who is ready to listen. So because of that, he teaches anyone who is willing to listen, not just the crowd in front of him. And for that reason, he had everyone in mind. He had us in mind, you in mind, me in mind, all of us in mind when he was giving these teachings. No one is excluded from this. So you are sitting here, you're reading the teachings of someone who actually had you in mind, not when he was giving these teachings. And he's coming purely from compassion, wishing you the greatest happiness in the world when he is giving these teachings. There's nothing else that these teachings come from. That. This is why he is the supreme guide for those who want, wish to train, yeah? Because of the purity and the power of these teachings, the understanding, the underlying things, the, the underlying things that, that uh, uh, underlie this whole career of the Buddha, if you like. Yeah? Career might be the wrong word, but you, <laughs> you know what I mean there. And he's the teacher of gods and humans. Uh, yeah, the all beings in samsara are affected by these teachings. Uh, it doesn't matter where you are. Uh, and the idea here, of course, is that the Buddha has understood the world, whereas the Deva, as the gods, well, they haven't really understood it. They have just been reborn in a good location uh, by virtue of their kamma, their, their good actions. So he is everyone's teacher. And uh, one of the things I sometimes have reflected on is, well, what is a, how can we think about the Buddha to make him more of a teacher for us? Yeah, what other kind of a, a skillful way of, uh, um, you know, kind of meeting the Buddha, if you like, you know, of uh, having a more of a direct interaction with him? Uh, and one of the ways of doing that, of course, is to read the suttas. After you read the suttas for a while, you uh, get a feeling for the person of the Buddha, you just have to get the feeling for the kind of character he was. Occasionally, he might crack a little bit of a joke, yeah. But usually, he gave very direct and immediate teaching. He didn't talk any nonsense, yeah. Very little. He might, he might have said, Hello, how are you? Where are you coming from? Have you got enough to eat? Uh, are you well? Okay, now let's go. Kind of very, um, very direct teacher. Yeah? And uh, you, you get the feeling for this very person with lots of wisdom, but wisdom in a very practical way. He was always concerned about the path. He was not concerned about wasting time on philosophy and speculating about the world. Yeah? You also get a feeling of someone who is very kind, yeah? very caring, and trying to do the right thing for people, but not always kind in a kind of soft way. Sometimes it could be a bit tough as well. Yeah? If he felt it was necessary, sometimes he would just walk off yeah? and it was okay. No one wants to listen to me, no point for me to be here. So he would walk off. There's a couple of cases of that in the suttas, which are kind of interesting. Of course, when he does that, he doesn't do it with harshness, but he does it because it seems necessary in that situation. So you get time to get a feeling for the Buddha by just reading the suttas and seeing him in different situations. And one of the some of the best suttas to read to get a feeling for the Buddha is the middle hanging sayings. Sometimes also the long sayings. They are full of suttas, uh, and they show the Buddha interacting with people, how he deals with them, various kinds of people in various kinds of situations. And you start to get a feeling for this remarkable spiritual genius, uh, you know, the greatest spiritual genius in history uh, by far. Uh, the suttas are this unique, a unique piece of literature in human history. There's nothing really like it. Uh, it's just uh, amazing. Yeah. And uh, then you have to make this spiritual genius into your teacher. Another way of doing it is to go to India. Yeah, I don't know if many of you have been to India on the pilgrimage to the Buddhist holy sites. Uh, I've been there a few times and it can be very inspiring to see some of those places and, and to recognize the places that you read about in the suttas. And it's almost strange because when you have the books and you read the suttas, it's you know, it's real, but it's also a little bit like a 
fairy tale because we we're used to reading fairy tales and books yeah and and it's hard to really make it fully real but when you go to india and you actually see those places they are exactly as described in the suttas well then it makes it real in a very different way yeah? and then you go to this place and you try to feel some of the energy the vibration the intuition of power or whatever in these places yeah? not everybody gets this but some people get it yeah? It gets very, it can be very, very inspiring, uh, depending a bit on your personality. Uh, that is another way of getting a feel of Buddha, yeah? getting an understanding for what this person was like. Yeah? And there's another, another way which uh, sometimes you can do is just to build up a kind of fantasy, an imaginary meeting with the Buddha. What does it be like to meet the Buddha? Uh, yeah? And you can imagine yourself at the Buddha, you know, you've, you've heard from someone one that the Buddha is in the, in the woods here somewhere, sitting at the root of a tree, yeah? You have been taught this, uh, because that's where the Buddha very often would uh, stay for the day's meditation practice after going for arms around go to the forest. Uh, and you have this important question in your mind. It's a really important question. You need a spiritual master to ask this question. You have heard there's a Buddha here. Wow, I'm going to take the question. So you can imagine, yeah, and on, on the one hand, you're very keen on meeting the Buddha. On the other hand, this is a person with a massive reputation. Yeah, this is a person who is praised by the wise, let alone by ordinary people. He's praised by gods and humans, it says in the suttas. Here is someone who kind of stands above everything else. And it's kind of a bit scary. <laughs> it's intimidating to meet a person like that, a person who is so kind of, you know, has such a reputation. It is intimidating enough sometimes to meet spiritual masters in our present day if they really are powerful, let alone someone like the Buddha. And so when you start going into this forest and approaching this Buddha, you start, you feel intimidated. You probably feel a bit of fear. Yeah, what am I going to say? What, what if I say the wrong thing? What do I am I dressing him? Should I bow first or should I not bow first? I don't really know if I'm a disciple. What is the right thing? <laughs> yeah, you get all of this social anxiety. You might be the most socially confident person in the world until you meet the Buddha. And so suddenly you become this piece of jelly. You're kind of shaking and quaking a little bit because. This is really intimidating, even for the most confident people. So you walk into the forest, and as you walk in the forest, suddenly you catch the sight of somebody. You see someone sitting at the root of a tree. And then you gradually you approach this person. And as you look, what you see is someone who looks like an ordinary monk. Yeah, they look like a monk, they have a shaven head. He has robes that look a bit like monastic robes, even in the present day. And they're sitting at the street. And there is a very benign and peaceful feeling about this person. There's something very beautiful about it. The anguish, the fear, the anxiety starts to fade. Because you start to realize that there is no way in the world that this person is going to criticize you. There's no way in the world that if you do the wrong thing, if you say the wrong thing, well, for this person, it's not going to work. He's used to nervous people coming up to him, they're dealing with him, so he would never really think about it. Once. And so your confidence picks up a little bit. Yeah? And, you want, and the closer you get to this person, the more you see this, this aura of benevolence and peace around this person. These are perhaps the two strongest external manifestations of someone who's gone a long way on the path, but the feeling of metta, benevolence, kindness that is there, combined with a sense of deep peace. And as closer you get to the person, the more you feel that you are in the presence of something really special, something unique, just like meeting someone very special in the present day. Eventually, when you arrive at the Buddha, you know that you want to bow down. You know you want to bow down. Not necessarily because of the person, because you don't know who the person is, but because of the qualities that the Buddha represents right here and there. This person is special. So in the same way as we bow down to a Buddha statue in the present day, because the Buddha statue represents that peace and kindness and love and all these kind of things, in the same way at that moment, the Buddha represents all of those qualities. So you bow down, and then you sit down, and then 
to ask your question, right? But before you get the chance to ask your question, the Buddha will ask you, how are you? Where have you come from? Are you, are you well? Yeah, he will do some small talk just to make you feel even more relaxed than at ease. And then, because you are in the presence of someone who has so much peace, you too become really peaceful, man. Yeah. And maybe what happens next is that you don't, you, your question is gone. Your question, you have lost your question of mind. You don't really want to say anything anymore. You just want to sit next to the Buddha and just hang out with the Buddha, not do anything else. Forget about those blooming questions. This is so nice. Who wants to ask questions when the atmosphere is so good? It's very different when you meet the Buddha from when you meet an ordinary person. If you meet an ordinary person and no one talks, it gets very awkward very quickly. Yeah? <laughs> and it feels like sometimes, at least with some people, it depends a little bit who the person is. But with the Buddha, it's almost the opposite. It's awkward to talk because the situation is so nice the way it is. You don't want to talk. You don't want to break the spell of that peace that is there. And um, this is maybe something you have uh, you have seen in your own life. Yeah? Sometimes you are in the presence of somebody and the presence of being with them is so beautiful. There's no need to say anything. Yeah? It's a bit like when we do meditation as a group. Yeah? We sit together. We kind of draw on each other's energy a little bit. And we kind of support each other. And of course, that support, that psychological, emotional support, which is there, that is much more important than the talking. Yeah? And that is much more of a... Uh, beautiful thing that having a conversation about these things. So, so you know, maybe you sit in his presence because it's so wonderful. Or perhaps you don't. Perhaps your question is still there because it is an important question, yeah. And then you uh, say to the Buddha, oh master, may I please ask a question? And the Buddha says, of course, please ask what you like. And then you say, oh, I'm not sure if this is a good question to ask your master, but you know, I'm having problems with my husband and wife. What should I do? <laughs> yeah. This is a typical question that you get, yeah? If you are the Buddha, if you are a monk or a nun, yeah? This is the kind of question because this is what matters in people's lives. So they want to know about these things, especially if they're not a Buddhist yet. They don't really know. These are the ordinary problems that we have in our lives, right? So people ask these things. And of course, the Buddha is not going to get upset. He's not going to say, are oh, you wasting my time? Ask me about anything for your sake. No. The Buddha is going to say very peacefully. He's going to give you some simple advice. Yeah, How to understand your husband and wife in the right way. How to understand that they are yeah, just following their conditioning. They're just doing what they can do. Yeah, And if it doesn't work out, well, maybe you should have a divorce down the track if it is too hard. You can always become a monk and then later on that. I don't know what the Buddha would say, but you know, something very simple. Then. And this is the power of the Buddha's teachings, is how clear they are, how simple they are, how direct they are. There's very little sense in the Buddha's teachings. And that is why they are so powerful. And that is why they kind of go to the heart and we can understand them straight away. And sometimes they may be a little bit enigmatic. And the point, of course, is that any powerful spiritual teacher should be a little bit enigmatic. The whole point is that if you understand everything straight away, the teaching doesn't have all that much power. So you might say something which is a little bit kind of unusual, yeah? and, and uh, that might kind of catch your mind. Like, wow, that is interesting, and you think about it afterwards. Uh. And then the Buddha gives his answer, and then you bow down again because you are so impressed, the presence that's almost you bow down naturally. You don't have to force yourself. It just feels right when you are in the presence of something so beautiful. But, and then you walk away. And that meeting with the Buddha lasts in, in your mind. It leaves incredible impression in there that you cannot get rid of. It. You've been in the presence of something really special and unique. This is for people who are ready for this. Yeah, There are some people who will not be ready. But for those who are ready, they will feel this in this way. Then they will walk away and they will think that this will work. Something, something will happen in their psyche. Yeah? The idea at the very beginning to see the superior people, the good people, and then the path begins. And eventually, if that person is ready, that initial input from the Buddha will take them all the way to awakening down the track. So um, 
the Buddha comes across, yeah, as a, in many ways, as an ordinary person, uh, but as an ordinary person with very exceptional qualities. Uh, and that is what is so powerful with the Buddha. Uh, so uh, this is just an idea, something you can develop in your own mind, uh, yeah, the need for the Buddha, uh, what that might feel like, uh, and see if that makes any sense to you. And then you can imbue the Buddha with some of this, uh, remember him in the right way, like this. Uh, Anyway, teacher of God and humans, awaken, blessed. Blessed, like the Lord, yeah, the, uh, the kind of something very elevated. But uh, so the idea here, and remember the whole point of all of this is to give rise to some good feelings. So try to do this in your own way, in a way that works for you. There is you, know, you can use this as a framework, as this is what the Buddha himself recommends, uh, but to be able to make something out of it uh, that uh, works for you. And maybe it won't work for you, maybe it is too hard to feel a relationship with the Buddha in this way, and if it is too hard, well then, then don't do it, then go on to another contemplation step. Uh, just experiment with it and see what happens in your life. Uh, but if it works, then this is what happens. Uh, when a noble disciple recollects the Buddha, their mind is not, it is, is basically free from desire, ill will, and confusion. Yeah, because you are remembering the higher truths of the world, the Buddha really representing here the higher truths. Yeah, the movement away from the sensory world, the movement towards the, uh, the calm inside. Because this it becomes prominent in your mind, then all the defilements just fall away by the way, because now you're focusing on Dhamma qualities. Your mind is fully which goes in the opposite side, opposite uh, direction from defilements. Uh, and because uh, those defilements are not there, your mind is said to be straight. Uh, but the Siddhartha has unswerving here, but Ujju, straight is like a more direct translation, but I guess they're both, uh, both acceptable. Base on the realized one, based on recalling the qualities of the Buddha. And the mind whose disciple is straight, straight means precisely lacking in defilements, uh, finds a joy in the meaning of the teaching, finds joy connected with the teaching. And here the Pali word for joy is a Veda, a meaning is a Atta, and the teaching is Dhamma, so you find this thing called the Atta Veda and Dhamma Veda. Veda means something like a, a cross between knowledge and feeling. Yeah, you know something and you have some understanding of what is going on, but you also feel it. So uh, uh, I quite like Bhikkhu Veda Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, here, which is inspiration. Inspiration in the meaning. The meaning is the goal of the teaching. Yeah, you understand something about where this is leading. It is leading towards happiness, towards metta, kindness, peace. All of these things you can see that in the character, in the person of the Buddha. So you should understand something about the aim of these teachings, and you also understand the teachings themselves. The teachings are powerful and beautiful precisely because they have this goal. That's why they are so beautiful. So inspired about this, an inspiration in the English language, and I think maybe any European language, the word inspiration uh, means, yeah, if you are inspired by something, you feel lifted up, you feel elated, you feel like a sense of uplift, it's a good thing. Inspiration is also, also has like a cognitive side of understanding something, yeah, you understand, so you are inspired. This is almost very, very similar to this double meaning of Veda in Pali, Atta Veda, Dhamma Veda. And when you have this Dhamma Veda, then you get this joy connected with the Dhamma or connected with the Buddha in this particular place, in this particular case. And then this whole process starts to take off. Yeah, the process that we have seen all the way through here. So now you can use that contemplation, you can take it further if it works for you. Or once you have given rise to some joy, you can combine that joy with the meditation. Or really, here there is really just a 
whatever works for you is really the right way of doing this. So, but uh, it probably comes to the point here where you want to use the breath. Yeah, the breath, breath is the most powerful meditation in the sutta. So, what you can also do, you can use the breath, and then sometimes you can just very gently nudge the mind into this kind of contemplation, just remind yourself the Buddha. If you have done this kind of reflection many times, and sometimes all you have to do is say the word Buddha, and it reminds all of this all of these positive character traits, and then the joy comes automatically because of the association of those character traits with Buddha. It just comes to mind. You watch the breath. Just nudge the mind a little bit, and then a bit of joy comes, and you carry on with the breath. Yeah, it's like a seamless flow of, of things that happen. Anyway, so then you get this the standard sequence. Yeah? When you are joyful, the rapture springs, the peak comes, uh, you get more and more joyful. Yeah, uh, and this is kind of the point there when the rapture becomes very powerful and it starts to come down, then the body becomes tranquil, when the body is tranquil, uh, you get the happiness of tranquility, the profound deep sense of stillness and peace. Uh, and because the power of the happiness and stillness, you are drawn towards the object of your meditation, uh, and the mind enters samadhi. The power of the stillness, the power of the joy, is what draws you in and enables you to find this uh, otherworldly bliss and peace uh, that is there, available in samadhi. Uh, then you get, the, you get the stillness of the mind, yeah? And a person who has that stillness of the mind, well, they are on the doorway to insight, even more insight, yeah? So it, here, it is even after this that further insights will obviously happen. Yeah? But even if you don't get those insights, yeah? And still, you are called the noble disciple who lives in balance among people who are unbalanced, yeah? because your mind is even. Your mindfulness is steady. Yeah? You're not being buffeted around by the defilements of the mind. Uh, you are basically kind of cool uh, and you're able to function in the world in a very, uh, in a much, in a far superior way. Uh, you are not troubled among people who are troubled uh, because uh, a mind that is troubled is a mind that is full of defilements uh, because this is where trouble arises. Uh, troubles of suffering, troubles of not seeing things clearly, not understanding what is going on, trouble of living in a stupid way, of doing things that are immoral, all of that has been abandoned when the defilements also are eliminated for a short while. And for this reason, you are someone who has entered the dream teaching and who develops the recollection of the Buddha. So that is the first of these um, uh, six recollections, and um, uh, you may try it out. Yeah, I would recommend you to try this thing to see if you can make it work for yourself. Uh, everyone is a little bit different. Uh, the places we find inspiration is going to vary a lot from person to person. Uh, so very often you have to just uh, experiment a little and see what actually works for you. Uh, but uh, this is a way of kind of befriending the Buddha becoming more familiar with the Buddha, trying to understand the person is. And uh, the more you do that, the more ability you will have to relate to this person in this particular way. Yeah. And then you bring it into meditation, and your meditation gets a, may get a very big boost as a consequence. Yeah. Anyway, let's uh, stop there, and let's do some more meditation together. Yeah.
I allow yourself to relax and find that ease of the body and the mind. It is useful to understand the sequence of things. And as you do so, you kind of learn how this meditation progresses really well. So just relax, take your time, and get into the right mood for meditation practice.
as you start to calm down and your mindfulness becomes established, uh, very gently just nudge your mind in the direction of uh, recalling some positive spiritual experience in your life. Uh, a time when you did something that gave you joy, uh, a time when you were generous in a way like you rise to happiness inside. Uh, bring that to mind. Bring to mind that feeling of living well or doing the right thing at this point. And uh, dwell on that very briefly and uh, see if it allows you to access more and more clarity of mind. And uh, as you give rise to a positive perception in this way, just leave that perception at the back of your mind uh, So it's sort of accessible at the back of your mind somewhere. Uh, and then join that with a breath meditation. Uh, very gently allow the breath to appear in your mind, in your consciousness, uh, while you keep, keep that spiritual perception uh, at the back of your mind and you join that gladness that joy uh, with the breath and then you allow the process uh, just to take you forward. you are the passenger that uh, the process takes the lead
Okay, so again we're coming to the end of the meditation and, and before we come to the very end, uh, just try once again to reflect for a few moments uh, on the progress you've made uh, and try to understand the nature and the uh, conditioning process of meditation practice. <coughs> Okay, everyone, that's it for now. We'll see you back again in a couple of hours.